Matt, can you hear us? Matt, can you hear us out there? Excuse me. One of these days I'll be over my cold. This one's lingering. <laughs> Matt, Lane, anybody hear us out there? Yep, we can hear you. All right. Maybe my volume's just not up high enough. I did hear you that time, though. Excellent. <laughs> Apologies, I've had a cold since last week and I'm still a little bit stuffy. Mm -hmm. All right. Looks like we got some decent numbers. Yes. Uh, let's see here. We have uh, <clears throat> calendar. Looks like we have chapter three due and chapter four to start this week. Yeah, it says it's due tomorrow, so hopefully we'll be able to finish it up today. And I don't have all these quizzes populated with quiz questions. I just put them in there because I was hoping to get them populated, but I haven't done so yet. Chapter four, I'm thinking we're going to have to maybe put off till next week. We'll go ahead and put it to next week and See if we can start chapter four Wednesday. We'll see how that goes. Um, like I said, I don't think I have anything populated for quiz for chapter three, so it doesn't matter that it's in a weird place. Let's take a look. At that. You're moving chapter th three's homework? Um, no, I was just moving chapter four. Oh, okay. Uh, chapter three right now is still scheduled for tomorrow. We may move that to, to Wednesday. But just so you know, there is nothing under the quizzes for three. So there's nothing in quiz three or quiz post or pre quiz three. So you don't have to worry about that. There is an experiment in experiment three. And that's something we should talk about. Has everybody done the first two experiments? Are we good there? If you're not, if you're not quite done with those, make sure you get those to me. You can, uh, you can just send me an email and say, uh, I need quiz, I need uh, experiment two move so I can uh, enter, you know, so I can upload that. But I can do that if necessary. But otherwise, we have experiment three and chapter three homework due this week, essentially. And then um, experiment four will be next week with that. And we'll see if I can actually get a quiz for chapter four put up. We'll move chapter five out of the way. Slowly move things down the road here. Kicking the can down the road. <clears throat> we should be able to get, I, I think that we should still be able to get um, to chapter five before the end of September and, 
and get and get our first exam taken by the end of September, which keeps us well on track for this semester. We only have uh, we only have twelve chapters this semester and fifteen weeks to do them, so we don't have to be in a super rush. <clears throat> We're only about a week behind at the moment, so that'll be good. Um, Yeah, so let's go ahead and and work on uh, some chapter three stuff some more. And come on, come on, come on. there we go. And let's go. So, and if you have anything, if there's anything that you're you de definitely don't want to get behind in this class, we haven't really started doing anything super difficult, but we're getting to the point where things will get more challenging right away here. So don't get behind. If you're getting behind, you need to catch up. Make sure that you send me an email right away so that I know what I can do to help you. And, and we can get everybody all on the same page, doing the same stuff at the same time. We don't want people falling behind. So be aware, be aware of that. And I will try to be aware of what's going on out there too. It's not always easy for me to know what everybody's doing, but. I will do what I can to keep people caught up. All right, so um, chapter three here. We are. Oops, wrong class. Let's see. Try this again. Textbook. Okay. Okay, we got how far did we get? Did we get to acceleration? We actually got into the kinematic equations, right? 3.6. Yeah, we got into the in kinematic equations. So we got, we did some free fall stuff. Did some free fall, okay. So we're into the last section. Now, things that we should remember from the previous sections of this, of this chapter, quite important. We have all these definitions, position, displacement, velocity, and then when we got to that point, when we got to displacement really, remember, excuse me, that displacement has a specific vector definition. You take your, take your final position, you subtract your initial position, that gives you your displacement. It not only gives you a point to point straight line distance between those two points, but it also tells you the direction by using a sign, right? And then we talked about velocity, and then we pointed out that speed is, um, is different than velocity, where velocity is your displacement, that vector quantity displacement, final position minus initial position divided by time. Speed has more to do with the distance that you traveled to get between those two points, regardless whether you went you know, on a straight line or not. And that takes us back to displacement because there's this thing called distance, which is not displacement. Distance is the actual measurement of the distance you travel, whereas displacement is the point to point vector uh, quantity between the, the beginning and ending points. So there's distance and displacement, which are different from each other. There's velocity and speed, which are different from each other. And then we got to acceleration. And acceleration, um, is defined as the change in velocity. So you take your final velocity, subtract your initial velocity, and divide by time, that gives your, your acceleration. We also learned how if you have some kind of functional, some function that describes your displacement, you can take a derivative of it and find a function that describes your velocity. If you have a function that describes your velocity, you can take a derivative of that in time. 
and calculate your acceleration or, or get a, a function that uh, can calculate your acceleration. And that has to do with instantaneous, that those functions are usually um, are tools for calculating your uh, position or your or your uh, velocity or your acceleration at a specific point in time or um, giving you some instantaneous information. Then we talked about how we can build these equations using those definitions and a bit of algebra. We created these kinematic equations. And if you go into section 3.4, you have a table of these kinematic equations that you can use to solve different problems in different situations. But all of these situations involve constant acceleration. If you don't have constant acceleration, you can't use these five equations to solve for things, right? So this is kind of like a toolbox of formulas that you can use to calculate different things when you have the constant acceleration situation going on. So lots of different things we've done in this chapter so far. Um, one thing that we probably should reiterate is the difference between uh, negative acceleration and deceleration. I think I hinted at it a little bit, but I didn't really talk about it in great detail. And let's see if we can, and they are doing some loud work down the hall. I don't know what they're working on, something with pipes. I know they're bending some copper pipes. Okay, so they don't have a, they don't have what we're looking for here, but we'll, we'll, maybe in the previous section. So, um, one of the things that we like to point out when we're talking about acceleration in particular is um, how there are different kinds of scenarios with acceleration that can be confusing. They don't really show it here either, so I'm gonna have to make it up. All right, uh, let me find a nice open spot here where I can draw. I'd have to go use my whiteboard. I'll use my whiteboard. Okay. So this is a little discussion on acceleration. Acceleration. Man, that's just messy. I'm just gonna type it. This is acceleration versus deceleration, okay? That's what this, is, this discussion is gonna be about. So what we're going to do is we're going to have some cars or trains or something, whatever you wanna call them. And we're going to um, put them through different, we're gonna have different situations, different scenarios. Four different scenarios to be exact. So these are my cars, put some little wheels on them so you know they're cars. Not gonna be very round wheels, but you know, we'll take what we can take. So these are our cars. And each one of these cars is going to be in a coordinate system where to the right is our positive X direction. if I can actually draw that. So it'll be a positive X direction. To the left will be the negative X direction. And each one of them is going to have an initial velocity represented by this blue arrow like this. So those are the initial velocity of the first two cars. These are the initial velocities of the last two cars. So this is V0, this is V0, 
This is V0. This is V0. You can see here that these two V0s, these two initial velocities are definitely positive velocities to begin with. And these ones are obviously negative velocities to begin with. Right? Now we're gonna give each of these cars an acceleration and we're going to decide what's going to happen to each of these cars with, with the given acceleration. So this is gonna be my acceleration for the first car pointing in this direction. And what is this acceleration going to do to this car? What is the effect of this acceleration on this car? Okay, it's already moving to the right. So it's gonna increase its movement to the right, okay? That's what acceleration does. Acceleration changes velocity, right? So if the, chain, if the acceleration is pointing to the right and the velocity is pointing to the right, then the acceleration will change the velocity to the right more, which means this, this velocity will increase to the right. In layman's terms, we would say that this car is going to speed up in the positive direction or speed up to the right, correct? So the overall result of this situation is that your V final will be pointing to the right more in the positive direction, right? Well, what happens if we have an acceleration of a car that else that has a velocity that is going to the right, but the acceleration is now to the left. What is the result going to be here? Velocity is gonna go down. Velocity will go down. Okay, we have two people that say that. Anybody disagree? So our final velocity will be less. right after some amount of time in fact you can really say that the velocity will decrease by this amount by this length every second that's what acceleration does is it decreases it by the length of or the magnitude of the acceleration every second so after one second this velocity will decrease by about this much which will mean that it's about this much after one second right So this would be our final velocity. After two seconds, it would be almost to zero, right? Because it would be decreased by this much again, almost to zero. What would happen after three seconds? It would actually stop at some point during the, between two and three seconds, because between two and three seconds, you've taken off two and almost, you know, two and more of these, and that will take you down to zero. So it'll stop a bit at some point between two and three seconds. But then in that remaining time, it will actually start going the other way, right? It will start accelerating in the negative direction. But after one second, this is about what happens. Okay, which one of these would you call deceleration? Either of them, both of them, neither of them? The second, second one. Yeah, the second one. That is what we usually call deceleration. Okay, now let's move on. In our third one, we're gonna have acceleration this direction. There's our acceleration vector. There's our initial velocity vector. What's going to happen to this car after one second? Okay, it's initially going in the negative direction and the acceleration is in the positive direction. So you say it's going to slow down. Anybody agree with that or disagree with that? And what does slowing down mean? It means it's not going as fast in the negative direction, right? And it'll slow down after one second by about this much, which is about you know two thirds of that. So our velocity will still be going to the left, but it'll be going to the left 
only a little bit. That will be our final velocity about, about. And it's still going to the left, right? What if we change that acceleration to the left? What happens to this one? Anybody? What's that? This one has an initial velocity to the left and it has an acceleration to the left. So what does it do? Higher negative velocity. Continues to go more to the left, right? So it's going, so this velocity gets bigger or a higher negative velocity, as you said, and its final velocity is about that much more, about this length of an arrow more to the left. So it's increasing in the negative direction. Now, which one of these would be considered deceleration? The third one or the fourth one? Third one. Okay. We have a consensus for the third one being deceleration. And why? What is the same between the second one here, which we call deceleration, and the third one here, which we call deceleration? What is the same? Just the change in velocity going down. So like acceleration in the opposite direction of the velocity. Yeah, that's really what it comes down to. You can say two things. You can either say they're both slowing down from their original velocity or their acceleration and their initial velocity are in opposite directions. That is the definition of deceleration. The definition of deceleration is that the acceleration is in the opposite direction of the initial velocity. Now, this one here, the second one, which is deceleration, has an acceleration that is negative. But that doesn't make it deceleration because this one down here also has an acceleration that is negative and this one is not deceleration. This one right here is deceleration and has an acceleration that is positive. In other words, the sign of the acceleration does not determine whether it's acceleration or deceleration as we define them kind of in the vernacular, right? Now, a lot of times physicists will try to avoid to use, using the word deceleration. It's kind of hard, we tend to use it anyway. But we try to not use it because it can be confusing. But instead of doing that, I just, tr I just try to help people to see this that acceleration and deceleration have specific meanings. Acceleration really is just change in velocity. And you can use it to mean that something is speeding up, but you can also use it to mean something is slowing down. All of these things are acceleration. This one just happens to be acceleration in the opposite direction of the initial velocity, as, do, as, as does this one. It just happens to be that as well. These ones happen to be acceleration in the same direction of initial velocity. Acceleration has no, it's, it has no bounds. Deceleration has bounds. It has specific definition to it. If you're decelerating, then your initial velocity is decreasing in whatever direction it's, it, it began. In. And the, better, the best definition really of deceleration is that your acceleration is in the opposite direction of your initial velocity. And of course, that can eventually become acceleration in the other direction, right? So um, that's something that's important to just kind of understand about acceleration is that it has, these, it has this, um, this direction that can do different things. The direction of the acceleration compared to the original direction of the velocity can determine whether it speeds up, slows to a stop and changes direction or just slows down, right? It can, it can do any one of those three things. And uh, it really just depends on the relative direction between acceleration and velocity. All right. 
<laughs> so, that takes us to um, the last thing that we did last week, which was free fall, in which we learned the one, one very specific application of the kinematic equations. If you are thinking in terms of things falling through the gravitational field of the earth near the surface of the earth, they are all falling at a pretty much constant acceleration of 9.8 meters per second squared downward, which we usually call the negative direction. And when that is the case, then you can immediately use the kinematic equations with the acceleration in those equations replaced with negative g, where g is 9.8. And so you get a new set of equations that looks like this. And they leave off the first two equations because the first two equations don't have acceleration in them, uh, but they're still valid. But anyway, you get these three equations as the main kinematic equations, and then you can solve for things that are falling in the gravitational field near the surface of the Earth. You can also use these equations near the surface of other planets or moons with a different number rather, rather than 9.8, for example, on the moon, you would get about one sixth of that, about 1.5-ish, 1.4 or something um, ish um, meters per second squared of acceleration near the surface of the moon. And, uh, and these equations would be valid with that number in for G also. Um, but the, um, all of the math ends up being the same. And one of the things that we, that we see with free fall is we see the, the symmetry of free fall, particularly if you, if you throw an object upward with an, with an initial velocity like they do in this example here. In this example here, they, they hit a ball upward and they say that where you, where you contact the ball at the back, is going to be y equals zero, and then it's going to then it's going to go flying upward, and then it'll come back down and be caught at that same point. And the symmetry is that it is due to the um, it's actually due to the quadratic nature of this equation here. This equation here actually will track the path. The, this this tracks the height in y of the ball. If the ball has some initial velocity upward, v naught and the constant gravitational force G. And because it's quadratic in time, it creates a parabolic curve in time and space. And that's essentially that parabolic curve shows that the, um, the, the position and the velocity of the ball has this, has this symmetry to it. So if you wanted to say, for example, if you wanted to, uh, if you wanted to graph out the velocity of the ball, if you hit the ball upward, so the ball is going upward like this and then downward like this, right? And if the velocity when you hit it upward is um, 50 meters per second, when it goes up, gravity is gonna slow it down every second it will slow down by about 10 meters per second because the, the acceleration is, um, is about negative 9.8, about negative 10 meters per second. So after the first second, which, is, which would be right here, um, it'd be going about 40 meters per second. And after the second second, it would be going about 30 meters per second. And after the third second, it'd be going about 20 meters per second. And these aren't spaced out really well. It would be a bigger space at the bottom and smaller space if you go up. And then it would be about 10 meters per second. And in the top, it, of course, would be zero meters per second. So every second as it goes up, it slows down by another 10 meters per second until it stops. And then as it goes back down, it's experiencing the same acceleration. But now it starts moving in the opposite direction. So after one second of dropping, it's at about 10 meters per second after about two uh, seconds of dropping, it's about 20. After about three, it's about 30. After about four, it's about 40. And after about five seconds, it's back to where it started. 
but it's now going 50 meters per second downward. And that's the symmetry. The symmetry is that at different heights of the ball and at different times, you get the same velocities, but they're in opposite directions, right? Same magnitudes of velocity, but in opposite directions. <clears throat> you also get the same distances traveled in time. So if this is the, if we actually map out the distances in the first second, it's traveling 50 meters per second. And so it actually travels a fairly long distance. And that's just in one second. Um, and it's slowing down that whole time, but it started at 50 meters per second. But at the, at the second second, it's only going 40 meters per second. So it travels a shorter distance in the next second and then a shorter distance in the next second after that, and then a shorter distance in the next second after that. So the first second, the second second, the third second, the fourth second, the fifth second, it hardly travels at all. And it comes to a stop at the top of it. And then on the way down, the distance that it travels from when it's stopped to on the way down is a small amount of distance because it's moving very slowly to start. And then it speeds up, so it travels further, and then it speeds up and it travels even further speeds up, travels even further, speeds up, travels its farthest yet, and it comes back to that original point. So that's what the different distances look like, going up and coming down. And yet each of these, you will have a different velocity. You'll have a big velocity of 50 here. Let's make that a bigger arrow. A big velocity of 50 when you start, but at the next one, it'll drop down to quite a bit smaller, to 40, and then to 30, and then to 20 and 10, and then it's at zero. And then it goes back to gets to 10 after the first second, it gets to 20 after the third, uh, second second, gets to 30 after the third second, to 40 after the fourth second. And then at the end of the fifth second coming down, it's back to 50 meters per second. And this is actually why it looks like people who are jumping in sports that's why it looks like they have hang time at the top of their jump, like, they, like they're jumping and they're floating, is because they're slowing down, slowing down, slowing down, slowing down, and then stopping at the top of their motion. Near the top of their motion, they're either going really slow or they're actually stopped for a good second or two if they're, if they're a baseball and they're going this high. If they're just a human being, it's just for a fraction of a second. Um, the highest person, the highest a human being has ever jumped is about two meters, uh, three, almost three meters. I don't remember the exact height of the highest high jump. It's like eight foot something. But uh, so it's not quite three meters, two point something meters. And that will keep a person in the air for about two seconds maximum, uh, one point something seconds, 1.7 seconds. And at the top of that motion for like, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 seconds, it looks like they're just sitting still because they're going really, really slowly and stopping. And then they're slowly starting to move again, right? But that's, that's really the, the optical illusion is that's from that symmetry of slow motion at the top. And of course, at the bottom, it looks like they're moving super fast because they are compared to the top. So anyway, um, the great thing about this is that the mathematics here in the kinematic equations account for the upward and the downward movement. It will calculate the turnaround, it will calculate. So for example, if you want to know, if you start off with a specific velocity um, jumping upward, you can actually calculate how long it takes you to get to the top of your motion by saying, well, the end of my motion is gonna be when I stop because the end of the motion is at the top of the motion. If you know your initial velocity right here, you plug in that number, and then you say the top of my motion is when my velocity equals zero and you plug in zero right here, then you can use 9.8 and calculate the time. So let's say for example, that you take off from the ground moving at one meter per second. So I'm going one meter per second, I put in a one here. I want to know how long it takes me to get to the top of my motion. So I'm gonna set the top of my motion. I know my velocity will be zero. Then I subtract off G times T, which is negative 9.8 times the time. And I solve this equation, right? When I solve this equation, I'm gonna get one divided by 10, essentially one divided by 9.8. I'm gonna get a time of about point, 
0.1 seconds. About that, not exactly that, but about 0.1 seconds. One divided by 10 when I add this to both sides and divide by 10 on both sides. So that means if you take off from the ground going about one meter per second, you'll stay, you'll, you'll reach the top of your motion at about 0.1 seconds. And actually that's not far off from an average person's jumping time. Most people have a very low jumping time, very small jumping time. And that, that's probably about half the, the average jumping time. Most people can, can probably get off the ground at about two to three meters per second and stay in the air for half a second or so. That's about the average for most human beings. Um, that's actually on the high end. I'd say that's a little bit higher than that. But um, really, really great athletes can stay, can, can jump in the air and be in the air for about a second, maybe a tiny bit more than that. From a phenomenal world-class athletes, about a second and a half. So anyway. That is the last section we covered. Now, taking us to the very last section of the chapter, um, we have, we're gonna use now our kinematic equations along with, along with calculus to actually create equations that describe a system. Um, so in this case, we're actually taking a step further than, than, uh, than doing derivatives. Now, how many of you have taken calculus two or are in calculus two? We have a couple of you that have taken calculus two, okay. Um, if you haven't taken calculus two, then the idea of the integral might be a little bit foreign to you. But if you've taken calculus one or you're in calculus one now, um, what you really need to know about the integral is that the integral is also called the antiderivative. In other words, it is the opposite of the derivative. Uh, the derivative and the, and the integral are opposites of each other and they essentially undo each other, right? If a function does something to a number, the anti or the, the, um, the inverse of that function, which the integral is, will undo that. So if you have a complete derivative, if you have a, a complete derivative of something, dx or whatever, and you take the integral of dx, you just get x, plain and simple. The only real caveat or the only real thing that you have to be aware of is that when you do this, you, you actually have to have a initial value for that to actually evaluate the, the problem. So let's say that I'm taking the derivative the full derivative of the acceleration, which is what they're doing here. Uh, the full derivative of the acceleration is actually going to give you the velocity. Remember, if you do the derivative of the velocity, you get the acceleration. So if you do the full, sorry, I said derivative before, but I meant integral. Um, if you do the full derivative of the velocity, you get acceleration. But if you do the integral of the acceleration, it will take you backwards to the velocity. But it's, not, it's going to not tell you what the original velocity was. It's gonna tell you the functional form of the velocity in time. Um, and it may be constant, but it's, you're going to need to add on to that the original velocity or the initial velocity of your problem. And that's what they're doing here when they add a constant here. They add, they're adding on essentially the initial velocity. And that's not something that you have to worry about too much at the, in, the, uh, in the moment. Um, you just have to understand that it is that is the case that there will be a, a constant of integration which will be equivalent to the initial velocity or the initial position or whatever in the end. Um, when they do when they're doing this though, they're actually just showing that doing this integral, for example, of acceleration or doing an integral of the velocity is going to take us back to where we started and it will actually create the kinematic equations again for us. And so they do it in this case right here uh, with the velocity, the velocity will equal the integral of the acceleration. When they do that, they get this solution. Here's their, here's the actual um, uh, kinematic equation for uh, the velocity. 
let's see how they actually doing this. They are actually doing here. So here, here they're doing the integral of the acceleration. Uh, the acceleration uh, is has a derivative attached to it because of the definition. Um, when they do this, the derivative itself becomes instead of dt, the integral of dt becomes t. So we get a times t plus the original velocity. And when you add in that original velocity, you get the final velocity equals the initial velocity plus a times t. The a times t came from the integral, and this was the integration constant. This, of course, gives us the same kinematic equation. So this actually is showing mathematically um, that you can get the kinematic equations from the, from the um, calculus. Now, I don't remember if I actually give you a problem and ask you to do that in the homework. I don't think I do. Um, but if you were going to, you would essentially just follow these exact steps. It wouldn't be a terribly difficult thing. Um, in the in the next one, they take this they take this answer and they plug it back into an integral over time. And in this case, you're getting a times t dt. And in that case, you actually have to you actually have to compute the antiderivative. You have to compute this integral. And when you have v naught times dt, that comes out with as a v naught t. But when you have a times t times dt, you actually have to do a derivative in reverse with derivatives. Remember, you subtracted one from the from the um, from the number in the uh, exponent. You subtracted one from there, right? And you brought the number that was up there down in front. In this case, you do it the exact opposite. You actually add one into the into, into the um, uh, into the exponent. And then you divide by the number that's in the exponent after you back it. And so that's where the one half AT squared comes in. Once again, if these things don't make sense to you, um, if you've never done integrals before, it's not that essential to understand it at this point. It's just, um, it's essential to understand that these uh, kinematic equations do have a mathematical justification, you could say, or a proof to them. So you can actually prove that they're true mathematically. And that's what they're doing here. So there's that kinematic equation. That's the quadratic in time. Uh, here they actually do use it as I, this would be an example of a problem where you would do something like this. And in this particular case, they actually tell us the functional form. Um, let's see right here. So here they're telling us what the, the functional form of the acceleration is. And we're going to do an integral of this to calculate the functional form of the velocity. So it's like, it's like creating or building our own sp specific um, kinematic equations for a, a situation that doesn't have a constant acceleration. This is obviously not a constant acceleration. It's changing in time. So if we want to know what the functional form is for the velocity, we take an integral of this. To take an integral of this, we take the integral of at dt which is what they do right here, AT dt. And they do, they do recognize that they're gonna to have to add on a constant and that constant will be in the initial velocity eventually. But when we do this integral, we put in the function negative one fourth T dt, that's one negative one fourth T is the, is the acceleration function. When we put this in here, you can see that you have a T dt in here. The negative one fourth is a constant. It just comes out of the integral, just like constants come out of derivatives. So the negative one fourth comes out and then you do the integral of t dt. It's exactly the opposite of doing a derivative. Instead of taking a number from taking, instead of subtracting from the exponent, uh, bringing the exponent out in front and extract, uh, subtracting from the exponent, you actually add a number to the exponent and then you divide by whatever is in that exponent. And that's where we get the, that's where we get this in the end. So we add a negative one fourth. We end up with a one half, which leaves us negative one eighth t squared plus c1. Now, if you wanted to, uh, if you want to see how this looks in general, this would be, this will be helpful, I, I think. In general, for any integral of a polynomial function, which is the kinds of things we're going to have, if you have a 
fun, if you have a constant out in front, constant A out in front in your, in your polynomial, and you have T raised to some power N, and then DT here, there's your derivative. This will always integrate to become something that looks like this. The A will come out. You will add one to the exponent of the T. Then you will divide by N plus one. And then you will add the constant. And the constant depends on what you what this function is. If this function inside of this is an acceleration function, then this will be a velocity. If this function inside of here is a velocity function, then this will be a position. So it always kind of takes one step backwards in the in the derivative process. So that's your general form for doing that antiderivative or integral if you've not done that before. And if I did give you a homework problem like this, and I, I can't remember, like I said, if I did or not, but if I did and you're struggling with it, don't beat your head against it forever. Um, either look it up on a YouTube video or uh, send me a message and I'll make you a video or a, a short tutorial on how to do it again. Um, this is mostly just to get experience using integrals in the way that Newton used them. Once you have that formula that they've built here, so they've built a formula for V doing that process. Here's their formula for V. Since they know it's a formula for V, then they know that their constant here needs to be V naught or the initial velocity. Then they can use this formula, one, negative one eighth T squared plus V naught to calculate the velocity at any time. They just plug in whatever time it is, time five seconds. They plug in five into this formula, they get negative one eighth five squared plus the initial velocity, whatever that is, and that'll tell them the velocity of five seconds. That formula is good for any time after you've created it, you can use it at any time during the experiment. Um, then they go on to, to do another derivative. They do a derivative of this formula to get the, the position formula. And that one results in this formula down here. And then they can use this formula to calculate the position of this object at any time with C2 equaling the initial position wherever it started at. And it, it works equally well there. So they do that. You can also see that the, uh, the formula, so the form of velocity being a quadratic formula in T squared, you can see that it is a parabola type of curvature, right? Whereas the position formula is a T cubed thing. It has a much steeper curve to it than this parabola does. This is no longer a parabola. It's definitely a much steeper curve. It jumps down quite a bit. And that is that it takes us to the end of our first real chapter on physics. Next chapter is the same stuff. We'll be doing the same thing, except in multiple dimensions. So we will start that on Wednesday after we answer any questions from the homework on Wednesday. So have a good afternoon good day tomorrow we'll see you wednesday make sure that you've started your homework and have questions to ask on wednesday so that we can be ready to answer them. have a good day you too see you later <laughs>